that's all set to go. Okay, okay so let's see that, that that's forward, yep. that's back, yep. and the red that's, line that's is the laser, laser pointer. pointer. Okay, and that's all I need. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. All right, everybody, I think there. we're ready to get started. Um, <coughs> my name is Kate Stevenson, and I'm the executive director here at Yes Tomorrow, and want to welcome you all to our summer lecture series. Uh, this is our second lecture of the summer, and we have 10 in Wednesday night through the end, Wednesday night through the end of August. Um, but we are taking next week off for 4th of July, so um, come back on July 10th for the next one. And just to give you a sneak preview, um, we have Jess Phelps coming, and the talk is on preserving buildings of the modern movement. And um, he it works with Historic New England, and so the talk is co-presented by um, Historic New England. So. That's the sneak preview for next week. And this week we have um, Mario Messina, who's here from Northern Vermont. And the t his talk is The Adventures of a Compulsive Maker. <laughs> uh, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Um, and let me just get the lights well. <clears throat> so see your slides. So I want to uh, thank you all for coming out to see my lecture. And uh, also thank Yes Tomorrow for inviting me to participate in their lecture series. Um, um, I am um, I've been a studio furniture maker now for close to 30 years now. Um, my journey began in Roseburg, Oregon, um, in a, a small cabinet shop. I was actually, let me go a little bit further back. Uh, I lived in Oregon. I bought some land 40 acres away up in the mountains, uh, did the back to the land thing. And so I had a little homestead off the grid. Um, and um, worked in a, we had a forestry cooperative um, that we, uh, I was part of. Um, but I was looking for another career. I came across some books by uh, James Krenoff and also uh, George Nakashima. Um, and was just really moved by that. Um, I really loved working with my hands. I had built my own timber frame house on my land. Um, did a lot of um, crude carpentry furniture, uh, but I really wanted to learn fine furniture making. Um, one of my neighbors had some cabinetry uh, built in her house, and I uh, was really impressed by the workmanship, and it was a local cabinet maker in Roseburg, Oregon. Um, and so I was really kind of thinking, well, you know, I was getting tired of the forestry work and so um, I approached this guy about apprenticing with him and he happened to be very busy at the time uh, and was really generous with his knowledge and um, so I spent three years with him working with him and by the time I left there um, he was turning entire jobs over to me so that that's how I got started as a professional cabinet maker um, <clears throat> then in 86, um, my wife and I, former wife and I, moved out here to be closer to family. Uh, ended up in uh, Heartland, Vermont, and um, worked for a bit there <clears throat> in doing restoration carpentry. Um, there was a bit of a recession there, I think, I don't know what it was, 80, 86, 87. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the carpentry work uh, dried up, the builder went out of business, so I thought, well, this is a good time to start my own cabinet shop. So um, I was also building a house at the time, so I uh, set up my cabinet making shop in the basement and built my house up from the ground up from there. <laughs> and. Uh, well, as it turned out, I, you know, I had some connection with other builders, so I was building a lot of custom kitchens at the time. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, people started asking me, well, can you build us a dining room table? And then pretty soon it was, well, how about an entertainment center? How about a library? And pretty soon the commissions got more and more uh, high-end. Um, and so I outgrew the basement and uh, rented a... a industrial space in Windsor, Vermont, where I stayed for 18 years. It was about a 3,000 square foot shop uh, in a really beautiful turn of the century mill building. Um, <clears throat> and invited some other woodworking friends to come in and join me. So we kind of shared the overhead, the equipment, 
um, and even collaborated on large uh, projects and stuff. And so we, we were able to um, do some very large architectural type jobs and um, built that business up for a while. Um, I also, in 93, um, took a part-time job with um, Dartmouth College in their student workshop there <clears throat> on weekends uh, teaching and uh, just to be there to kind of make sure people don't cut their fingers off and <laughs> things like that. Mentor them through their projects. Um, so, and I still work there very part-time. Um, presently, um, uh, well actually, let me go back a few years. Um, I moved, <clears throat> after 18 years in Windsor, I moved my shop up to the Northeast Kingdom, to Lindenville, Vermont, and um, <clears throat> leased a space up there. Uh, and this was um, 80, uh, I mean 2007, uh, 2008, everything crashed. <laughs> um, so it was like, okay, what is plan B, <laughs> you know, uh, after about six months of no work at all um, and a lot of overhead, it was like, okay. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> at the same time, um, Karina Dis Driscoll, um, Blake Wallstein, and um, Bob Fletcher were starting the Vermont Woodworking School. It started out in Colchester as a community shop, and then um, <clears throat> they decided to uh, move it to an old barn uh, that was renovated uh, extensively. Basically, they, one of their um, members um, was, had a, a bit of money. Uh, he was a developer, said, look, I'll, I'll renovate this whole barn and set it all up if you guys lease this as a school, so that we have a 10-year lease. Um, <clears throat> and I, I knew Karina and um, Bob through um, the fine furniture shows. I'm also part of the Guild of Vermont Furniture Makers, um, and it's a, it's a group of 30 uh, master craftsmen. Um, and so they, they uh, invited me to come teach some classes there, and at the time I was teaching um, and making your own hand plane, like Krenoff style wooden planes, and uh, also some of my bending techniques, which I'll demonstrate tonight. Um, and as the school grew, um, they, they partnered with Burlington College. So they ran a, a two pronged program. One was a non degree program, a 15 week intensive program in furniture design and woodworking, and then the other program is a degree program through Burlington College, um, and that program is, um, it has a certificate, advanced certificate, and a BA and a BFA program. And um, <clears throat> so we have, <clears throat> so now I am artist in residence there, and the, uh, one of the uh, faculty there, I, I head up the immersion program, which is the 15-week um, intensive program. Um, we are now ab about to be purchased by Burlington College, so from, uh, Karina is basically selling the whole shoot and match to uh, Burlington College now, so um, <clears throat> that we're kind of excited about the new developments there. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, this is kind of a slideshow of um, some of the stuff I've been doing throughout the years, I tend to be very much, um, <clears throat> so this is kind of just a background of a lot of it I've already gone through. Um, can everybody see those chairs or is that just my angle there? Okay, so. Oh, the lamp. Yeah, let me turn that down. It seems to be obscuring it. Um. Yeah, Oops. Yeah, no, we'll just leave it like that. Does that work? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> A lot of my work tends to be very sculptural. I like curves and fluid lines. Um, so this, this chair I did um, <clears throat> back in 97, 98. Um, 
and I still do it to this day. Uh, it's one of my signature pieces. In fact, I just, it was in a, sh uh, the last piece I built of this series um, was in the um, Helen Day Art Center show. The Guild had a show there, and so uh, this winter. Um, <clears throat> and so um, it's one of my favorite pieces to build. And it involves a lot of tapered lamination, sculpting and carving. Uh, the fan is all hand carved. The, uh, the back portion of uh, the backrest um, is a series of curved and tapered laminations. Can you walk that way so that we can get the slide and, the, and you in the photo? And me, okay. <laughs> Great. How's that? Perfect. <clears throat> and the armrests is, are also um, a lamination technique. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I like to bend wood. <laughs> uh, this is um, a sunburst table, um, <clears throat> and mac macaray, veneer, and ebony inlay. Uh, and that is to go with a set of chairs, of the, uh, the terrillium chairs as well. Um, you can kind of see the chairs as a, as a group around that. Um, I have a thing for rocks, beach rocks. <laughs> I was always coming home with rocks in my pocket as a kid. So I do a lot of sea kayaking, as you can see the kayak here. Um, <clears throat> so I was always finding these beautiful granite beach rocks that were tumbled by the surf and stuff. So. Um, I ended up bringing some home <laughs> and wanted to design a sculpture under glass series uh, incorporating some natural found objects and stuff. So this is um, one of my uh, coffee tables. So you can kind of see that. Did you do any further sculpting to the rock? No, that's entirely tumbled and polished by the surf. And uh, these rocks, you know, you'll, you'll go on the beach and in certain areas where the gradient is just right, you're exposed to ocean swells, the granite in the area is very fine, hard granite. <clears throat> they tend to be rolled by that surf and they come up beautifully polished and very spherical. Um, uh, that rock I found in a friend's yard down in uh, Rockport, Mass. This whole front yard out there was boulders like that. And the challenge was climbing up the bank from the beach with that in my arms. I think it weighed about 85 pounds. So it was a bit of a workout. But I came home with about eight rocks like that size. Um, the back of my car was like that, going home. Um, <clears throat> since then, people have been bringing me rocks, too, <laughs> to do stuff with, so. Um, so this piece incorporates um, a lot of symmetry, some kind of implied, what I call implied dynamic tension. It's not really real tension, but it kind of implies it with the uh, rope lashings and stuff and, and the uh, spreading of the armatures, the way they arch. Um, Oh, that, yeah, the light's coming down from those screens up above, huh? Is there, it's not There's really. not really a great way, just because yeah. um, we close the shade, but when the light hits it at a certain angle, it's just going to come in. Yeah, Are some all right. Are these images available online, maybe, that we can look at? Yeah, um, if you go to Vermont Woodwork, uh, vermontfurnituremakers.com, You'll come to the Guild site and uh, just look me up there, Mario Messina, and uh, you'll see some of these images. They're not all of them, but some of them. Um, so here's some more sculpture under glass. Uh, yeah. Wish we could, uh, probably the light as it gets further down. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, so I did a whole series of coffee tables that were sculptural. Um, this one is kind of covered panels that come together. Um, it 
Victoria Amour um, was commissioned by a client in Stowe, Vermont, um, and that one uses some beautiful um, quilted big leaf maple, which is a very three-dimensional veneer. It's a um, gorgeous figure to it. Um, and Clara Walnut, which is uh, from California, and it's, it's a distinct species of walnut that grows on the west coast. Uh, very beautiful wood. Um, that is a synagogue commission. Um, <clears throat> and it really can't see it too well, can we? Um, the, the doors. I can try and adjust the brightness on the projector, but I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, let's go back. <laughs> Here we go. Um, that one? So some of these I've put in various different shows. Um, Mystic Art Association furniture, invitational, and things like that. So, um, the focal point on that piece right there is actually, um, well, it's a stack of rocks that are suspended inside this pod shape that is something that resembles a peat pod. Some people see it as a, as, as a boat or something on the ocean. And the rocks are the ballast rocks or the cargo or the uh, people in the boat or whatever. Everybody sees something different. Um, but <clears throat> that is actually a large, what I started with to make that part is um, turn a very large bowl about 16 inches diameter, cut it in half and then glue the rim back together so you can reconfigure the shape entirely. So what started out as a large bowl ended up looking like a pea pod. And then I sandblasted the outside of it, <clears throat> and then the inside was painted uh, black, and then the rocks are drilled through with a bronze rod and suspended in that void, so it kind of floats in space above that. So, um, And there's the quilted mahogany, and no, quilted maple. Um, now this... Um, was commissioned by Sher Shalom in Woodstock, Vermont. And uh, the doors are a bookmatch pair of um, Vermont slate, a grayish kind of green slate <coughs> uh, with a natural um, face where they split it. So it has a lot of texture to the face of it. Um, and the Ten Commandments in Hebrew are cut through it with a water jet, CAD water jet. And then the entire inside is backlit from inside. Um, so, and the tree was, um, this is one of the times where um, a woodworker actually takes dimension lumber and turns it back into a tree. <laughs> so. So that was a very sculptural piece where I actually took very thick pieces of wood, built it up, glued it up, and then sculpted it and joined pieces together. <clears throat> all the leaves are all hand cut and shaped uh, from copper and then patinaed with chemicals. Uh, the table in front of that um, is, well, it's hard to see, but. Um, it's a large slab of um, beautiful mahogany that has scroll carved in, so it, it resembles a scroll that's been unfurled. And that's what they put their, their Torah scroll on. Um, <clears throat> the legs of that are carved and textured to look like a ram's horn. 
So they're like the shofar horns. Um, and that table also ratchets up like a big architect's table. So, um, and, and you might see, oh, what happened to the text there? That's odd. All right. <laughs> so you can see the uh, open, um, oops, let's go back. The, the Torah is inside and the door is open and then a side view of that and hmm, lots of text to that. Mm. Interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> now I got into uh, sculptural lighting, which is kind of a, a recent exploration. Um, and these are kind of nature inspired pieces. Um, some of them are strips of bamboo that are then bent um, with heat. I'll take a hot air gun and put it in my vise and bend it with the heat. And then when it cools, it holds that shape. And then laminating <coughs> various pieces together and joining them. <coughs> and then applying uh, a skin over it of um, unre paper, which is um, mulberry fiber. Um, very similar to um, what they call rice paper. Uh, there's other names, washi paper, uh, depends on which country. Unri? Yeah, it comes out of Thailand and it has a lot of natural fiber in it. It's unbleached, um, <clears throat> has a very organic character. In fact, the, the skin on that kayak is that, and you can see the fibers in it, the mulberry fibers. Um, so I like to use that because it allows me to uh, create a skin, build up a skin that's seamless. Because you can pull the edges of the paper apart and the fibers feather out. And then you can blend those together and layer them on top of each other with um, archival glues and create what looks like something that grew organically. Um, Now this piece, uh, I did a whole series based on the ammonite fossil. Um, right in the center, right there where I start, is an actual ammonite fossil that's about four to five inches in diameter. It's a whole white ammonite. <clears throat> and then I build onto that this whole wooden armature, a bent wood armature, and that's all plotted out on the golden spiral. So when I do this bending technique, um, the, the form is all plotted out with the whole Fibonacci series on there to, to uh, do that form. And the, um, <clears throat> the tentacles are all bent, tapered laminations. Now to create a lot of these required um, an innovative bending technique. Uh, I don't know, how many of you are woodworkers here? Yeah. Right. Well, as you know, you know, the typical lamination technique is to build a wooden form, either a two-piece form or a single-piece form, and then clamp all the different layers with glue every couple inches along that. Um, <clears throat> to create uh, spirals and um, helical forms and things like that, <clears throat> in thin dimension material, it, it becomes impossible to create a form like that. You be spending a lot of time building forms or just frustrated. And it would probably collapse under the weight of the clamps. <clears throat> so I have a technique of using um, no clamps at all. Um, and I'll demonstrate that tonight. I'm using uh, a heavy gauge stretch wrap as the clamping medium. And um, I can show you how that's done. And it's kind of a fun thing to watch. Um, so I done a number of different variations of these. Um, the largest one I did was a <coughs> hanging version. The shell was about that big around and then the tentacles spanned about seven feet and it hung from the ceiling. Um, <clears throat> and that was at the uh, State of Craft show in, in the uh, Bennington Museum the year before last, I believe. And uh, Eventually, it sold at um, Harbor Square Gallery in Rockland, Maine. Um, and that's where most of these sculptures have sold um, through the galleries I deal with in, in Maine. So there's another one. Um, 
So you can see how that, it's really a skin-on frame structure, just like the kayak, only in, in a more organic form where you have these ribs that are on the spine that's in a spiral. Um, <clears throat> and then the skin covers that. Um, I, I kind of gotten fascinated with skin on frame structures after building a couple of yurts and some kayaks and stuff. So. Um, and I like using lashings as a building technique too. Uh, if you <clears throat> have a chance later, you can peek inside that kayak. Um, the entire framework of that kayak is really based on traditional kayak building techniques. Um, the, the joinery and the lashing of all those ribs are all done exactly the same way that you would build a, a real Greenland kayak. And that's actually a scale model of, scale down model of a, of a Greenland style kayak. So, um, can't see the base on those, can we? Um, hmm. Oh well. Um, <clears throat> again, there's rocks. I don't know if you, can you guys see the base on those? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, I'm doing these series, these lamps, um, again, using that bending technique of, of the uh, stretch wrap bending technique. I call it freeform bending. Uh, and the paperwork, uh, some of them, I've laminated Japanese maple leaves between the layers of paper. Uh, some of them have ferns. And the bases of these are actually rock cairns. They're stacks of beach rocks, basically, that form the base to this armature. Um, if we can get these up on the computer later, you can see them um, after the talk. Okay, there you can kind of see the rock. Um, so that one has ferns in it. So this kind of talks about how I use these techniques um, to do these lamps. So I, I do a, a lamp class um, at the school and also this summer um, at the Mark Adams School I'll be doing a lamp class um, in August um, where we build a lamp similar to this minus the rocks. <laughs> Um, it takes a diamond core drill to drill through the rocks and stuff, and that's an elaborate setup that I have, so that's not really suited for a uh, class somewhere else, but, um, but we do a similar version of that. So um, they get a, a chance to try the bending technique and also the paper making technique and also learn how to wire, properly wire, um, to code uh, lamps. Um, so this is um, a very organic form. Uh, I did a whole series of pieces using veneer where I took sheets of veneer and <clears throat> overlaid uh, a very thin four ounce fiberglass cloth over both sides with epoxy and then put them in a vacuum press and created these sheets, these composite sheets that are very thin of all these different veneers. And then from there I could cut patterns out um, <clears throat> and join the seams together. And as you join those seams together, it pops into a shape. Now this, this technique is really transferred from a technique um, called stitch and glue. It's a boat building technique. Um, I built several kayaks um, that, that use that technique. And so I, after building those, I got pretty good with fiberglass layups and um, could get really clear um, surfaces without any bubbles and stuff like that. So I kind of transferred that technique over and scaled it down to create these sculptural forms. Um, and um, I'll show you some of that. In fact, Maybe I'll go over and grab one of these guys. And you guys can pass it around. And so these are crystalline forms, kind of like quartz crystals made out of various different veneers and burls. 
Um, so by laminating and sandwiching it be with fiberglass and epoxy, you create this composite shell that allows you to create various different forms, both geometric as well as curved organic forms, like the flower blossom. <clears throat> I don't know why the text has gone on some of these. Strange. So that looks like curly maple. That's oh. actually quilted maple, oh, big leaf maple. maple. Yeah, the same veneer from the armoire. So you can see just how three dimensional that stuff is. And it's really gorgeous stuff. It's one of my favorite veneers to work with. <clears throat> the other one that I think is a uh, mapa burl or something like that. It kind of looks like alabaster. So. so the inside of those um, panels where the seams are joined together, I use, um, basically I use a masking tape to pull all the seams together and then I what I, I use a, the boat building technique called filleting where you take a thickened epoxy you make it a peanut butter consistency using thickening agents. And then you apply it in those seams. And um, then when it sets, <clears throat> you, you, have all, you can take all the tape off and, and you create these forms that way. So it's kind of a fun thing <laughs> to play around with. Um, <clears throat> so um, I had seen a, a, a show in Seattle um, by some some of Noguchi's pieces, the Akari lamp series, as well as some of his stone sculpture stuff. So I was very influenced by that. Um, so these are s some things that are kind of organically inspired. I call them onion lamps. <laughs> Again, they're made of bamboo and um, lashed. Um, Parts. It's entirely lashed together, and then I apply this skin of um, unre paper over it. Um, and I'm also inspired by Calder, and this is my rock thing. So this one um, <clears throat> is kind of a very precarious mobile. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Having the ability to drill through rock with all the diamond uh, tooling um, really opened up some av creative avenues as far as that. Um, so um, this, that piece right there, those are copper. And um, I had com been commissioned to do another large tree sculpture and they wanted maple, a maple tree. <clears throat> and this tree sculpture was about, oh, nine feet tall and seven feet wide and, and had about 150 maple leaves all hand-shaped. Um, but what I did was picked a bunch of maple leaves of varying different sizes and <clears throat> scanned them into a, um, a vector file and then brought it to um, a guy that had a water jet CAD water jet and we um, cut it all out of sheets of copper and this thing just cuts like a laser right through. Um, saved many, many hours and it took all the beautiful edge detail of the maple leaf. Um, and each one is a unique maple leaf. And so all I had to do was um, planish the surface and put in the veining details and then solder on the stem and then put that on my tree sculpture, um, so it created a, so those are leftovers from that, so I made a bunch of mobiles um, with maple leaves and stuff, so there's a close-up of it right there. Um, what is, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> they just like X'd it. <laughs> oh no. What happened there? Oh well, I guess we uh, we must have lost some stuff there. Huh? I shouldn't have shut my computer down, huh? <laughs> huh? Yeah, I guess that open office program. Um, 
There's one of my kayaks I'm building. Um, or it was building. Yeah, yeah, that's a hybrid. It, it's stitch and glue hull and then a strip built deck. You took an idea that a guy yeah. and I were talking about like 20 years ago. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, it's a good compromise because the hull, you know, why build a whole strong back and a form and lay up all these strips? Because it's just underneath you in the water and gets all scratched up. So um, <clears throat> with stitch and glue hull, you can get the hull panels glued up and together in less than a week or so and then onto the deck. Um, so it, it, uh, it was a nice compromise and, and it works really well. So. Um, so that's it. I'm sorry we lost some of those images because I wanted to show you the Tree of Life one. That one was a really nice one. But let me, uh, if we can get some lights on. I can actually show you some real eccentric turnings <laughs> since the images are gone. Um, <clears throat> Pass some of these around. Um, these are eccentric turnings. They're also called multi axis turnings. Um, I teach uh, <clears throat> wood turning classes at the Vermont Woodworking School. Um, so, one of my passions is wood turning. <clears throat> Right, none of this is glued, it's all one piece. Yeah. It's all one piece, it's turned out of a, it's a spindle turning, <clears throat> it's all turned as a blank. And what I do is, um, I, once it's rounded, it's held in a chuck over here in a center. I'll turn it into a cylinder, and then I'll back the tailstock out. This end is pre-drilled for a candlestick. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll turn this section here out while it's on axis. I'll do all the sanding and finishing, actually apply the finish while it's in that setting. And then I'll just loosen the chuck and tip it a few degrees. So now it's spinning on this axis and this end is just blurring, whirling around, whipping like this, you know, it's like that. So you can only see this section kind of. And you have to have a really steady hand to do that. And I actually have to stop every so often to see just what the heck I just did. <laughs> you know? And sometimes a piece will fly off the lathe. <laughs> but, um, so I'll do that section, um, shape it, sand it, finish it. And then I'll do this section between these two after I've shifted it again. And then um, each section is sanded again. And then, because you can never go back and find that exact spot later. So you have to go through all the steps for each change in axis. So this one has a one, two, three, four, five, six different axis. Um, so each one of these. So this one's kind of the broken pillar or the stick and water kind of illusion. Kind of fun, fun one to do. <clears throat> and it looks super fragile. They must whip around pretty good when they're off the bounces. Yeah. <laughs> What's your mortality rate on those? About half. No, no. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at it now, but yeah, the, when I was first learning, there were a few that came flying off, and I would lose them. You know. Um, you still have all your fingers, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We work safely there. <laughs> no. Safety is a real emphasis at the school. <laughs> yeah. So um, here's an example of a what you would call a segmented turning using a kind of a classic parquetry pattern. And those are little diamonds that are cut on a, actually a bandsaw on a jig that cuts out all these shapes and then you glue those together and then I turn that out and it creates a kind of cube illusion there on that. And then I find a lot of green wood on the roadsides and backyards and stuff. This is a piece of um, black locust. 
and um, <coughs> do a lot of live edge turnings too. So, um. what do you put? What's your the finish that you put? Um, I use a. What I do is I take a chunk of um, beeswax and I put it in a cloth, and then I'll um, <clears throat> while it's after I sand it to 400 grit, I will then it's still on the lathe when I sand it. Um, I will then apply some tongue oil onto the the rag with the beeswax, and I'll just apply it while it's spinning. And the oil penetrates into the grain, and then by pressing the beeswax, beeswax is a high temperature wax, um, and it's food safe. Um, and so that melts right into the pores of the wood, and you can actually buff it out to a really nice satin sheen. It's totally food safe. And it takes about five minutes to finish the bowl. It's like instant gratification, so <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> so. And uh, let's see what else. So I'm going to do a demonstration here, but I will probably need, yeah. Oh yeah. This is that bending technique I was telling you about. Now this was all done in one layup. And the only form I had for this was just a sheet of plywood and some finished nails that I would bend this and um, pin it. Now this <clears throat> is all white oak and there's probably, let's see, one, two, three. There's about five or six layers of tenth inch veneer. And each veneer tapers from a tenth inch down to almost a, less than a thirty second at this end. Um, hmm? Um, <clears throat> I made this jig that has a little foot pedal and a string and this little arm that comes down and this little platform. So I'll take each strip and slip it in there and then step on the foot pedal and it holds the piece and then I'll take my block plane and just shave it, shave it down. And, and it allows me with the little foot pedal and the arm, it allows me to shift that very easily and quickly. Um, when I first started to do this, it was like hand clamps and it was for, took forever to do, so I had come up with a simple solution. So that's what I did. Um, so this is all glued together. It's actually quite strong. Believe it or not, it is structural. So there were no clamps used on this piece at all. Now normally, you know, anybody who knows woodworking, when you do laminations, you should be using clamps. So what I'm using for a clamp, and you can pass this around, and, um, <clears throat> and a glue. This is a glue I use, Tight Bond 3. It has a long working time. It gives me about 15 minutes of working time. Um, and it's a waterproof glue, and uh, it works quite well for this technique. And this is actually my clamping medium. Now this is a 100 and, uh, 150 gauge, what they call bundle wrap. It's for binding pallets of lumber and stuff together. Um, it's, it's much thicker than your regular packing wrap. So this is basically a, a rubber band. <laughs> kind of. So when I put glue between all these layers, I'll wrap it very intensely. And then I'll just take it and shape it and then hold it in that shape overnight. And then you just cut off the wrapping and you clean up the glue and shape the pieces. So that's how I did the tentacles on the cephalopod sculptures and the cairn lamps shapes and stuff. So some of those are based on forms that I plot out either with nails on a board. Um, some of the helical forms, I'll actually take a big cardboard tube and act like a sauna tube and just wrap it right around that and just take the stretch wrap and just bind the whole thing right onto the tube and let it sit overnight. So this this technique really opened up a lot of creative avenues and those pieces are really an exploration of that technique. Um, 
And uh, it's not well known. Um, the only literature I found that was close to that was uh, back in the 70s by Seth Stem, who did some lamination work um, <clears throat> where he would fix some stuff. And he would wrap bicycle tire inner tube around bundles, but he still had to use clamps every couple inches. And he had these little bars that you could use a um, little ratchet gun or something to zip the bolts together to clamp it every couple inches. Um, <clears throat> this I kind of stumbled upon when I was trying to do some steam bending. Um, but I was steam bending laminations and the idea originally was I was going to take a thermal setting glue and then put all this glue between the layers, but I had to put it in the steam box, so how do you keep the glue in the layers? Well, I had this, this wrapping stuff, so I wrapped a bunch of them and then slipped them in the steam box and steamed them. Well, the experiment was a total failure <laughs> because the second I took it out, it instantly set and I could never get it into the form. Anyway, I had a few pieces that never went into the steam box um, that were glued and wrapped. And uh, <clears throat> the next morning I came back and just out of curiosity, um, just cut the wrapping open and look at it. And it just seemed like, wow, this stuff really set up hard and let's look underneath the glue. And the glue lines, lo and behold, were tight. And I was like, huh, I wonder if I could cold bend this stuff. So that was the next experiment, was to cold bend it. And lo and behold, it worked. So then I just kind of ran with this and been doing it for a little over 10 years now. And uh, so uh, <laughs> I once uh, mentioned this technique uh, to um, Jerry Osgood, who kind of pioneered a lot of the tapered lamination stuff. He was one of the... Um, furniture masters in, in New Hampshire um, and I told him about this and he kind of told me I was crazy. <laughs> you know? So it's like, okay, you know? you'll have to see it. So um, is there a place I can do some gluing around here? Maybe lay out a sheet of paper because it does get messy. Do you want to do it on um, the table? Sure. Do you want to do it on this table over here? All right, that'll probably work. Yeah, we probably want to lay out a sheet of paper or something so I don't get glue all over your table. Um, okay, yeah, why don't we set that right out here so everybody can see. It'll have to be a, a little bit longer than that. No, that's probably why now. That'll work. Right about there. That's good. Great. And we'll probably have a knife here. I can just cut it. All right, so I ripped these on the saw. This is just maple down to about a tenth of an inch. And uh, I like to keep all the strips in the same order that they came out of the board. Usually I'll make a, a mark, a, a discernible kind of a pyramid shape so that I can restack all these in the same order they came out of the board so that all the grain is running the same direction. And also, when it's glued back together, the grain reads true. So it looks like um, a solid piece of wood instead of just a random assemblage of pieces of wood. Um, and um, <clears throat> I've already tapered them. So they, they taper down to about 30 seconds down at that end. But before I do that, I'll also take the bundle and tape it back together um, and actually rip diagonally on a bandsaw to taper it in, the, in this dimension.
this way. Um, so that saves a lot of work. You can also taper both ends. You can you know, do a lot of different things. You don't have to taper it either. And the nice thing about laminations is they give you very fair curves when they bend. Um, if, you know, if, if you've ever done any steam bending, you find that you have to make very precise forms and really support the side that's in tension, the outside of the curve with metal strapping and end blocks. Um, <clears throat> and even then you don't sometimes get very fair curves with it. Whereas with this, you get very fair curves, which um, works really nicely for um, creating artistic sculptural work. So I use these in my mobiles too, the different armatures and stuff as well. Um, and you can go fairly thick with this stuff too. I've glued up stacks about an inch and a quarter thick uh, and about an inch wide. The limitation is the width because you're wrapping it. The pressure is really on the edges. So if it gets too wide, there's not enough pressure in the middle. So that, that's the limitation with this particular technique. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm going to apply some glue, and then I need a volunteer to help me wrap it. Um, and then we have to decide where we're going to shape it and hold it in place. Um, now I know what we'll do. We we'll use the wrapping to form it. So. Um, take that off. So tight bond three is a really good glue because it gives you working time, but it also, um, I like to work from left to right, so I'm going to flip this around. Now the important thing about this technique is that the glue acts like a lubricant. It allows all these layers to slip and slide past each other. So if you do <clears throat> starve the joint of glue, it's probably going to start setting up and seizing up and then you're going to get kinks and breaks in your bend. So um, I'm fairly, oh you know what, uh, paper towel. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, probably. <laughs> this is a messy job, and I never, I never wear plastic gloves with this because in the wrapping process, they always got tangled up inside the wrapping. <laughs> so um, it's, it's somewhat messy. But once it's wrapped, it's fine. Um, the glue doesn't drip everywhere because it's all hermetically sealed inside. Ah, great, thanks. So I'm going to just apply a fairly liberal amount down each one of these. Oops. Yeah, we don't want any dry spots anywhere. In these wider areas, I tend to wiggle it back and forth so it gets more glue on it. Up in here, about an eighth inch bead is sufficient. <clears throat> See, a little bit there. So 
the next thing is I'll restack this in the same order it came out. What I do is I smush it around so it coats both faces. And it also eliminates a lot of the excess glue. But it also saves you the time of trying to paint both faces. Because that time is of the essence with this technique. But it is important to get good coverage on both faces. Now, the selection of wood is really important, too. You need straight-grained wood without any defects, no knots, no short grain runout, no curly figure. Um, you just want really nice, straight, even grain. Um, and there are a number of woods that work quite well with this technique. This is maple, which works beautifully. But I've also bent cherry, hickory, the oaks, white oak, red oak, ash. Um, walnut to some extent, though. Some woods will bend more extreme than others, too. So now we just wipe off some of the excess here. Now I need a volunteer from the audience. <laughs> Any volunteers? All right. What I need you to do is just um, play some of this out, but keep tension on it. Because what I'm going to be doing is, um, let's see if I can position myself so everybody can see. Around on your side or stay on Right about there is probably good. Um, is that what I want to do? Yeah. Okay, so you want to hold back while I pull against it. What I want to do is really stretch this almost to the breaking point. So um, and I'm going to overlap about two thirds of my previous overlap. So this is acting like a big rubber band, basically. So even more resistance there. There we go. Is this always a two-person gig? Or do you have that? I can do this by myself, believe it or not, but it's a real contortionist act. <laughs> <laughs> the longest one of these I've done is about eight feet long, the, doing the spiral shell one. Yeah. Believe me, <laughs> my wrists were really burning by that time. Because when you're out here, you're all the way out here, the other end is like whipping around out yeah. there. So... Um, What I need to do is kind of figure out some kind of machine that will spin it for me while I just hold it. Put some resistance on this where you want yeah. it. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. So right about now your your hands get tired. Last semester, I had a student build a big piece of furniture using this technique. And she did probably about three dozen wrappings like this that were about six feet long. <laughs> kind of nice to have a, a, a rest on each end there. To, yeah. And then you just Tricky. 
it's not that easy. Well, also you have to get your fingers behind it to pull to get good pressure and a good wrap um, because there's less and less wood and it wants a twist also. Yeah. It might work, some sort of thing. Um, I'm getting a little, little, out a little more there. All right, so. Usually the last inch or so of this, you end up trimming off anyway because it never quite cures. Because this is hermetically sealed, it, the glue um, doesn't dry, at least atmospherically. But what happens is the water is absorbed by the wood. But there isn't very much wood in relation to glue at this end. So sometimes, quite often, the last inch or so, if you don't have enough wood there, um, we'll... Um... All right, so I'm going to bend this one way. <laughs> So you do have to do it slowly because you have to allow them to slip past each other. All right, so if I can get somebody to wrap the end of that right there. Let's wrap that right around the end of several times. Okay, now come right to here, to this point. Oh, no, nope. yep. you gotta keep it attached. What we're gonna do is use the stretch wrap to kind of hold the different bends together. Okay, now we're gonna go, okay, hold on. We're gonna come up here now. Um, that. Okay, and up through there. <laughs> That's it, we'll go. Right. All right, right there. We'll wrap it around that. And that's probably good enough right there. So we'll do that. So we'll just let that sit overnight, and you guys can unwrap it tomorrow. <laughs> you can twist, yeah, you can twist, you can turn in different dimensions, so it really frees you up. Um, you say the dry time is overnight, and then you open it at the end, there might still be a little... Part down at this up. end, yeah. it can be a little moist. It will feel moist, because, you know, there's no air getting to it. But it will set up. It won't delaminate, no. So, so yeah, it's kind of fun to play around with wood. You'll never look at wood the same. Yeah, yeah. So the, the thinnest you want to get it is about a 32nd of an inch at that end, because you got to leave enough wood for that to cure. Uh, if you go down to zero, then you just basically trim off two or three inches of wood off the end of your piece anyway. So, um, um, well, when I rip, I, I use the table saw with a really tight <clears throat> insert, zero clearance <laughs> insert, meaning the, the saw curve, the saw blade comes up through this very small slot because you're ripping thin strips they can fall down through. So, um, Are you using a thin curved blade or just regular blade? Uh, no, just a regular. We're, we're using uh, the saw stop saws, okay. saw stop blades. You do end up wasting uh, probably 60% of your wood is sawdust <laughs> <laughs> or hand plane shavings. <laughs> it is a very labor and material intensive process, but it definitely frees you up to do a lot of interesting things. So. Um, and the, the cool thing about it is um, 
This is much stronger than steam bending. When you steam bend wood, you really compromise the wood fibers. They start to crush on the inside of the curve. They're in compression. The outside, they're in extreme tension. So you do, you know, weaken the wood that way. But it's also an, you know, steam bending is also an economical way to bend wood too. But um, well, that you can't really do anything structural as far as like making a bent or chair with this technique. With this technique, um, actually, there's strength in numbers. Huh. So if you design with components that are grouped together, did did you actually? test how strong that one piece was, that one. The thick portion of that, you can kind of get a sense of how strong a bent lamination really is. I mean, right here, you can you bend on that, you'll feel how strong it is. So if you get a number of those grouped together, you can build a structural element in a piece of furniture. It's really only as strong as the wood. So down here, obviously, it's going to snap because there's not much wood there. Well, you, you sit on the, your uh, toilet chair. So you, I'm assuming you use this technique. I use a different technique on the trillium chair arms because they're much wider than this. And because they're wider, each lamination is wider, um, it doesn't clamp as well. Because really, the clamping force is on the edges of your lamination and very little in the middle. So you can build it up by the number of laminations, but not the width with this technique. Um, <clears throat> in the back, the other tapered lamination for the back is a whole other process. Um, <clears throat> that is actually run through a planer jig. And those are those laminations are five inches wide and about fifty inches long. And they run from five sixteenths at one end down to less than an eighth at the top end. And the only way I can do those is by making a special sled that ramps. And that sled <clears throat> has a, a vacuum chuck designed into it. So I set the piece in, and there's a vacuum hose hooked up to a vacuum pump. And that sucks it down tight, and then the whole thing runs through the planer. Um, and uh, it's the only way I can do it, because when you get down to that thin end, you're taking off a pretty heavy cut, and the last four inches would just explode in the planer otherwise. So, so that's how that, that's done. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> an inch and a quarter with the widest that you do? Uh, this kind of um, about an inch in width, and then you can go, you know, stack stack it up to about like that, about an inch that way, inch by an inch. Yeah. But you can't get wide. So. So once it's wrapped, you, you can't disturb it too much. Um, the other thing, um, well, maybe we can find it on my computer if I can bring it up. But um, <clears throat> I do these tree type forms where I'll actually do this lamination and then I'll use this as a, well, here I'll use this as an example. Say this is dry and set. The next day I'll actually use this as a form to bend the next wrapping against and then it'll branch out <coughs> from there. And then the next day, I'll do one against this side. And that's how I create these tree forms. So this becomes a form to bend at least part of it until it branches away, and then it's free form down here. Is that how you did basically so. those two that are coming together? These were done actually simultaneously. Okay. And what I did here was I wrapped to here, and then wrapped to here, and then did this final wrap, and then bent it all. It was kind of a crazy pull up session. I can get how you wrap that and that, but how did you wrap? I mean, I get, I get this wrap, but how did you get the curve then on this fine end here? This end? Yeah. Well, it was all plotted out on a, f this is all on one dimension, really. Um, so what I did was I had a, a plank of, or a piece of plywood 
and I would set nails. So I would bend it one way and just brace it and leverage against nails. Take another nail, set it here, and it would hold it there. Bend it some more out here. Do a whole series of nails here to hold that shape. And then one here, one there, one there, one there. Yeah, so they're different little. And then you just leave it. And then you can take it out later. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that that's how I do these kind of flat Have you ever tried planes. a taper slit for those thinner laminations like those? In the planer? On a little finish plane? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it really, you know, I don't know, I got pretty fast with a block plane. And I would, this took maybe 15 minutes to taper all these. Oh, wow. you know, so, um, it, yeah, you know, I think you'd end up losing more material in a planer trying to plane little strips like that. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so that's kind of the stuff I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know?